Gray, and um, I am um, a staff member at Opera America. I run the National Opera Center in New York. Um, I'm uh, extremely excited to be a part of this uh, conversation today with this wonderful panel. Um, so just uh, so that you guys have a little bit of context of what we're doing, first of all, you're in the Opera Artists as Activist session. If you, for some reason, are like, what is that, then you're in the wrong session, and now is your chance to leave, otherwise you're stuck with me for the next hour or so. <laughs> um, um, so uh, this, you know, this session really is to talk about what does it mean to be an artist and an activist at the same time. And we'll talk a little bit about just that track in general, and then also specific to opera as an art form. Um, part of the key focus of this later on will be opera takes so long to create as a piece of work, and so how can you be relevant and create quick pieces of work that are relevant and can be part of a conversation or a movement without having to go into a 15-year process, right? Um, but first of all, uh, I'd like to introduce our uh, wonderful panel here. Um, so we have Kehan Irani. Uh, she was a 2016 White House Champion of Change. Um, then we have Gil Sotu. Um, he is at the Old Globe Theater in uh, San Diego. He is one of the teaching artists. We have Laura Kaminsky, who is a composer. You've probably seen her in some of the other panels today. Um, and then we have Ben Krywitz, who is the Artistic Director of Nautilus Music. Um, so we're going to get started a little bit is, I'm going to ask each one up here of our panelists to give a quick one or two sentence version of who they are, um, so we don't spend the whole day with, they have such great bios that we could be here for the whole afternoon. Um, and then, uh, if you could all just define for me, in your eyes, what do you think activism is? Who wants to start? Alright, I'm going to just pick you all. Alright, we'll start with Laura. <laughs> So, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not sure I'm going to answer your question the way you intended it, but I'm going to talk about, like, we're all just human beings to start out. And we, have, we inhabit this planet and we live our lives, and if we just accept the world as it is, that's one way to live. And if we see the world as it is and we don't like everything about it, we can do something to try to change that. And if you are in that category, that makes you an activist. So then there's the question at the next level, which was, what does it mean if you're an artist activist? And the question is, what comes first, the artist or the activist? And I think it's all part of a whole. So I was an artistic kind of kid. I was also kind of a jock, and you know, I was politically engaged. And none of those things seemed separate. It was just all part of who I was. So. As a pretty young kid, I got involved in environmental activism. I was just a little bit young. I'm giving away how old I know. I was kind of young for the 60s. I grew up as a little, little kid watching Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. And then my mom was the beginning of the women's rights movement. And I was still kind of young to like go out on my own in the streets and protest, but I was applauding all of that stuff. Um, but as a 12-year-old kid, for some reason, maybe because it seemed a little bit safer, or maybe because I just loved nature, being a very urban person growing up on a 10th floor city apartment, um, I got involved in something called Students for Environmental Action when I was 12. And it was the first time my parents kind of said, really, you're going to go on a demonstration all by yourself and march with thousands of people? And I said, yeah, I'm really going to do this. And I did. And I felt that sense of, of energy from being in a community around something you believe in, thinking that your voice can have impact. And we marched down in New York City, down Central Park West, to what is now the Trump International Hotel. Yeah. Um, past that, and then ultimately to the General Motors building, um, and complaining about oil and you know, carbon and ozone, and I was 12, and I was learning all this stuff, and I still have my little button that says SEA, Student for Environmental Action. And, but at that point, I was kind of already writing music, um, and I kept writing music, little pieces, and they were abstract, no words, but they kind of all came out of me imagining a beautiful world and nature. And so, it was a part of my activism that I even realized. As I developed as an artist, so this is sort of like, I'm going to jump ahead like decades, but as, as an older person making work, making music, and telling stories, whether it's an abstract string quartet 
or a piano piece, or an opera, which really has a story and a narrative. Every piece tells some kind of a story. And so a lot of my work has been inspired by the social and political issues that affect my life. So I have a lot of pieces that deal with environmental um, activism. Some are more abstract, and there's one big project that I've been involved with that was sparked by a physicist who was tired of giving lectures to rooms of scientists about climate change, where at the end of his impassioned lecture, they get into a debate about whether the ice was melting at 0.06149 inches or 0.06147 inches. And he said, that's not the point. We're, we're losing this world that we've created. And man-made destruction is what is going on here. And he said, the only way to get through to people is through music, because it touches you to make you know what you believe in a way that the words can't. And so he invited the string quartet to play during his lectures. And he would make a point about water, and they would play a movement of Beethoven. And then people would sort of stop, and they'd actually absorb, not the pun intended, but they would absorb the emotional content of the music in, in light of his words. And then they realized they needed their own music, that Beethoven didn't quite work. And they found me, because they loved, they, they did research about people who wrote art, who made music in response to social and political issues. And so we created a project together that involves a, a photojournalist, an art photographer, a painter, I'm the composer, a string quartet, a physicist, and it travels all around the world now. And we do it in an engaged way, where there's a performance, but there's also a conversation with the local farmers about sustainable practices and with you know students in the university about recycling and so there's as well as doing a string master class. I mean, you know, it's, it's great where the art and social activism come together. During the height of the AIDS pandemic, I was living in West Africa where we didn't know in this country that there was a huge crisis, an AIDS crisis in Africa. We were too consumed with what was going on here. And I was living there for a year, and there were villages that had been completely wiped out. And I ended up writing a piece called And Trouble Came, an African AIDS Diary, which for about 10 years was, was regularly done on World AIDS Day. And to this day, all my earnings on that piece go back to the medical missionaries who built a hospital in a village in Ghana to, to support the AIDS um, patients there. So it just becomes one, um, and the stories we tell, whether they're abstract or specific as artists, um, that reflect how we feel about the world we live in, like that's kind of what we're here for. So that's, that's that, that was really short, but <laughs> you know, I mean, there was a lot of years and a lot of different things I care about, but I'm not to make this kind of a sense of how it's all Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kane Hannah, do you want to talk a little bit about your what uh, activism means to you and a little bit of your story? Okay. Um, well, basically, uh, part of my story I told to Kurt uh, when we were having some tea one day um, when he asked me about this panel, and I said, that actually, I don't think I would be uh, an activist if I wasn't an artist. And um, very specifically, it was because uh, as a young girl, as an immigrant girl, uh, growing up in a working class community in Queens, I definitely experienced and understood the experience of injustice, unfairness. I didn't have a, a very defined or um, concrete analysis of what racism really meant and how it worked and what the structures and all the history of it. My parents didn't either because they're coming from an entirely different context into this one, which they're also uh, learning and experiencing for the first time, um, you know, being in their own homeland in India as um, a person of, of that heritage displaced or put into this other experience where suddenly they've been identified as other, as foreign, as whatever. They were wrapping their heads around how, you know, how do we experience, or how do we understand what we're experiencing? But I was very, very sensitive to injustice. I was very, you know, I was so sensitive, I remember that I, uh, as a child, I had to stop watching um, WWF wrestling <laughs> only because um, it was part of the theater that, you know, the, the bad wrestler would, you know, do something that was against the rules to the good wrestler and the referee wouldn't see. And 
I was so upset that the ref referee was not seeing <laughs> the infraction, you know, and I just couldn't, I just could not watch these <laughs> these you know, wrestling episodes. Um, but so I was very sensitive. I didn't understand how to couch that. I didn't understand that there were movements and that there was, you know, kind of legacy of struggle and resistance. And um, it was only until I started writing and putting on plays in school that I realized that there was this form and there was a structure in which um, people could enter into a dialogue and into a conversation, into deeper engagement around issues that we didn't talk about directly. Um, and so it was the, the really the, the act of acting, the process of acting and creating stories that helped me to understand that there was a process of making change. And from that moment on, um, my art, my uh, you know activism really became one. And um, and I, I'll talk more later about how you know all the different spokes on that wheel. But it is you know sometimes it isn't the art that is um, most urgent. Sometimes it's just attending a meeting, getting educated, and figuring out how am I supporting the movement's goals that I'm part of. Um, and then sometimes it's how do I create art. Or sometimes it's how do I pick a pick a line out of a play or out of something I wrote in the past and and tweet about it in relation to what's going on now. So there are so many ways in which um, these things come together and, and are braided together. But it was really my experience of being young making art that helped me to find uh, a journey and a way to constructively be part of movement building and be part of that. Wonderful, thank you, thank you so much. Gil, what about you? What, is your, what do you think defines activism for you? What does that mean to you? Well, uh, as far as art as activism, it's really, about campaigning for, for change uh, in your life and in the lives of the people that you care about, your community. And I believe that art is one of the most powerful ways to campaign because uh, I, I don't know about you, but I don't remember very many speeches, but I remember Marvin Gaye's so What's Going On, you know? I, re I remember uh, going into museums and, and seeing beautiful pieces uh, of, of art that, that talked about what was going on at the time. And that stuck, stuck with me. That's the thing I took a picture of because uh, I wanted to take that home with me and live with it. Um, I, I, I come from a town called Oxnard, California. It's Southern California. And it's a very interesting town because it, within Oxnard, we have, uh, it was very, uh, it was pretty diverse. We had uh, Latinos and African Americans and Asians, but around it in, in like Thousand Oaks and Ventura and Camarillo, it was all pretty Caucasian, and uh, so when I started growing up, be becoming more mature as an artist, I, I was blessed because it was during the time of the Bush administration, and so a lot of, and I came up in the open mic scene, and everybody had things to say, you know? And, and uh, even growing up, like in Oxnard, we had a lot of undocumented workers working the field, so every time I would come go to school, I would see People working the fields, which of course uh, reminded me of my ancestors and how they had to work the field. And I, their kids went to school with me, and and when I would have sleepovers and everything, we would talk about how sometimes their parents wouldn't get paid or or they'd be abused. And and so when I was coming up in the open mic scene, um, it was the first time that I began to have these conversations, whether uh, listening to someone uh, perform or you know hanging out with those guys afterwards around a campfire, and it's the first time people would say like, hey, they're not paying the migrant workers who pick, pick the mushrooms, uh, so we cannot support Pizza Hut at this time. Or hey, they're not supporting this, so, and I started getting into those conversations and actually performing with those things in, in mind, so activism just became, just like you guys were saying, like a natural part of it, uh, of, of, because it's, it's all about what you input, in, in my opinion. If you uh, spend time just kind of, the things that you input is all on the surface, then what you output as an artist will also be surface level. But when you start to, to dig deeper, then uh, deeper things come. And you don't, you don't say like, okay, now I'm gonna become an activist. You just are an activist at that point, you know? Hey, thank you so much. Ben, what about you? Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this table. Well, like Laura, in the 60s. Uh, but a little growing up I did was in the San Francisco Bay Area, and you know, it was a time and place of ferment. Um, and uh, one of the mantras at that time was uh, the personal is political. Uh, and so the, the, uh, 
the glue band sort of be the all artists are activists. Um, and uh, that may, may or may not be true, but it does feel to me that positioning ourselves as artists, um, as uh, service providers, as soul workers, as creating events and objects for people to use to reflect on their <coughs> inner life as it relates to the outer life becomes a really important consideration. And there are those artists who say, well, I, you know, I'm not an activist, I just make my work and it's pretty or it's funny or it's engaging or whatever. Uh, it's entertainment. Um, and I would suggest that we need to reconsider the concept of entertainment. And entertainment is the strategy that artists use to engage an audience. Um, and uh, that's how we keep them involved in the piece and make sure that the piece speaks to them in some way. That is a, a, a piece that's engaging, is actually uh, entertaining. And I think that when we uh, think of ourselves as always being activists, as always being service providers, as looking at our communities, um, and developing a sense of, 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 uh, of proactive responsiveness or responsive proactiveness, I'm not sure which <laughs> how quite to put it, but the idea of being able to notice things, making a choice to respond to respond to it in a way that the audience can uh, uh, can use. And they may use it in a number of different ways that have to do with our strategies. I think that some of the pieces we make are to help us mourn. Uh, some of the pieces we make are to help us celebrate. Some of the pieces we make are to help us to inform, uh, to protest, uh, to challenge, um, uh, to change uh, situations. Um, and I don't think there's any one formula for how to be an activist per se, but for me it's about engagement with the audience and clarity around one's role as an artist. We'll talk more about how the author field deals with that, but that's Great, thank you so much, thank you, thank you. Um, I think from my end, um, I started just as, a, as an artist who was like, I only care about making the entertainment. Um, and then slowly, a little by little, got sucked into doing work that was a little more uh, geared towards specific communities. Through that process, um, with it before I knew it, I was a social, political, global outreach partner for the UN in North Africa, and I didn't know how I got there. Um, and it was uh, a moment for me when I realized that all of the things that I was interested in, all the art that I was making, was more resonant if it was applied to a specific topic. And that usually with those topics, if it was something that helped mankind or helped the community, it was more rewarding. So I kind of got sucked into it because I really enjoyed making people feel good um, and having impact and change. Um, and so for me, I think the, the what activism really means as an artist is being able to find a way, and some of my colleagues have said, to reach people, and the most effective way to reach people. Um, one of my favorite sessions that I did, uh, it was for a community that was dealing with female circumcision, um, and it was about finding ways to bridge the narrative between uh, communities that some people who wanted that to happen, and then obviously the people who were felt that was an imposed uh, order on them, um, was through song and poetry. And it just became, we would have fights after fights after fights at town halls and debates, um, and ultimately what ended up being somebody just giving five or six times their poetry, and their point of view and the other point of view, little by little, we started to bridge that gap and a, community, and a conversation started. So for me, and that was the moment that I found this is a really powerful tool. Um, so I wanna now just move a little bit into what we feel are some of the great successes that we have seen, um, particularly working as artists in this field, and then we'll talk about some of the challenges. So can you, what is a good, really great moment where you feel, you know what, I really feel that this artistic endeavor that I have done uh, has really helped create some change. I hate that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I understand it, and I, I'll go back to something that Ben said, you're also looking at what's the function of this work, right? So it's not uh, what, you're, what you're doing isn't going to solve a problem. You know, we have very deep entrenched <coughs> systemic problems that we've been working on for hundreds of years. Um, so I don't want to be so pompous as to say I'm going to make art and it's going to fix everything. Um, however, you know, uh, just as an acupuncturist has to, you know, make the diagnosis and, and put the needles um, exactly where uh, energy is needed to be released or to move, I can uh, look at a situation and say, you know, how can a specific work of art or a specific artistic intervention, whether it's my work or whether it's facilitating a group of other people to work from their own perspective. Um, how is that going to move something? And um, I, I think 
I would just point out to one thing that was just really, um, uh, I just finished working on that is continuing and I feel really good about, it, has been this partnership with the New York City Department of Health. Um, some folks uh, were in my previous panel, I mentioned it. But the, it's with the Bureau of Infant, Maternal, and Reproductive Health, and they have an entire campaign around birth justice and improving the outcomes um, of uh, maternal morbidity and mortality and infant morbidity and mortality in um, women of color and communities of color, low income and working class communities. And I was hired to be a storytelling consultant to um, a group of women that they were training to be birth justice advocates. They called them birth justice defenders. And these were mostly um, Latina women uh, from Staten Island who are working class and low income, some who had um, no literacy skills in their, their own language um, and had limited literacy in English, but they were being trained as birth advocates to inform and um, organize women locally to understand what their birth rights are, understand what, what their, um, the kind of processes and services that they are allowed, what claims they can make to ensure a respectful and healthy birthing experience in hospitals. Um, and so I was called in to be a storyteller consultant, both to help with the whole process of organizing them and building the community of women who were going to um, go out to the community and train others and, and listen to birth stories, um, but also empower them to tell their birth story and talk about what was it like, um, what, was, what were the traumatic experiences of you giving birth, how can we use those birth stories as advocacy bringing those stories out, and how do we consider bringing those stories out ethically, and with all the kind of uh, components that we, we want to honor in these stories, into other communities. So if they're starting here, how do we lift them up and respectfully treat them and bring them out to doctors, to OBGYNs, to healthcare administrators who need to understand these stories and hear them, um, and how do we still keep the power in the hands of the women on the ground who are, who are making these claims. So it was really a fulfilling, um, uh, event, I mean, uh, project. It's going on. They can, the birth justice um, initiative has continued, even though my work has ended. But the women, what they did with um, some of the training I offer them is that they've created little, you know, hand cards that have the image of one of the women or an image that they think is, you know, hopeful or desirable, and a little quote of her story that they're handing out in the community to bring people into their meetings and to say, "Come join us and learn about your rights." And they're also hosting an open mic. Um, Tomorrow, actually no, day after tomorrow, Saturday, I won't be there, but they're hosting a picnic and an open mic in Staten Island where they're inviting women to tell their birth stories in public together um, at this picnic. And so I'm just really excited um, about the way that they've taken storytelling and are really applying it and making, the, making it their own, but also moving forward the goals of this um, advocacy campaign. Can I, can I just ask a question? When you said they, how did you get they they put on 
you know, uh, can't do this, or, or we can only do it in this certain way, or, you know, uh, or uh, San Diego, in my world, is very liberal, but into the, to most of the world, to the actual San Diego, very conservative. Because um, we have that, we have the Navy town and, and everything. So, like, let's say dealing with the old globe, uh, the the people who pay the bills are, are don't look like me, really, to be honest with you. And so, but the the, the people who work inside, they do. And so we're we're always kind of battling, doing that battle. Um, I know I also do work with a theater company called Intrepid Theater, and one of the uh, going into just the challenges in in, in working with the participants. Uh, we did this refugee project, and in where we, we went to the high school, we spent about eight weeks, uh, each artist going one on one with a refugee student and learning their story, and then turning it into art. Uh, later on, we continued the project to where, uh, and then the artists were performed. Later on, we continued the story to where um, I would listen. It was a group of students, and they just brought me in. And then I, uh, I turned what their stories in, I spent several weeks with them, I turned that into uh, poetry and song. And what the, the challenge was, was that when they started to be, when we started asking them to become performers, you know, they were very shy and they were very hesitant. Uh, but they wanted to do it, but they were, and so kind of the fix was that uh, we were gonna perform together, like I was going to speak the words and they were gonna speak it, but as it went on, and because it was all about them and their experience, you know, not about me. I was just going to be there almost as a, a, a crutch or a handicap so that the students that they were performing for could understand them. Because that was the main point for them to be understood, like the, emotionally. Uh, but a transformation happened. Like, was when we started uh, practicing and performing, they're like, no, we want to do it. Like, we want to work hard. We, and so they did the whole thing by themselves, and it was the most beautiful sight to see these students who were so shy and so scared to, to really engage the language and, and speak their truths, um, just come out and be bold and, and, and perform in front of their students to say, this is really who we are, and this is our experience, and these are some of the misconceptions that you guys have had of us, and this is our first time like really saying publicly, this is who we are, and, and it was good because they got to do it not only for the other students in their high school, but they also got to do it for their, their families as well, which is a, a big moment of pride as well. So um, that's one of the ways that we, that it was an obstacle, but you know, I, I think in really giving people permission, and, and this goes across the board in art, giving people permission to, to share their story, to, to let them know that their story matters, then people kind of blossom most of my work is with uh, underserved communities uh, within San Diego uh, and people who feel like they don't have much of a voice and giving voice to that. So um, it's, it's a good challenge, but I, I love taking it on. Um, Laura, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the creative process that comes with creating works like this. So obviously you've had a lot of great success with your works, and is it a part of where, you know, you talked about how they just kind of come in and out for your activism and art. Um, are there moments when you're creating works that you think, this is gonna push me in one direction more than the other, or the producers might want us to do something more in this way, or the activist side of me wants to go more this way, or do you let that process play out on its own? I, I, actually, I, I now, I've never really thought about it structurally at all, because it's just organic, that this is what I do, you know, and sometimes it gets out of the world, and actually sometimes it's not successful. <laughs> um, but I, I feel like I can talk a little bit about my opera as one, since this is an opera conference, um, and so some of you may only know me through that work. Um, I will make this confession, which I have made to people here before. I did not come from the world of opera. I didn't know a lot about opera. I had barely written any songs, and I never wanted to write an opera. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, in, in my social, political awareness of the world, there are a lot of issues that I follow, one of which was marriage equality. Um, my wife and I went to Canada and got married because we couldn't do it in this country. And so we were following each state as it was about to make a vote state by state, and we were sort of tracking it. And I mean, we had 
one set of friends who went to every state as it became legal and got married in every state. And then that, that's a different kind of activism. They have so many pots of pants. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, we got married in Canada and we had a party with our family and friends in New York and that was fine. But we were really curious, like, is this ever going to become a, a national, federal, accepted way of being in this country. And it's a whole conversation about states' rights, which I don't want to go down that road right now, but um, you know, how can we be married here and not there? And like, what, I can rent a car there as a married couple, but if I go across state lines and we get in an accident, we have to pay if the other one, it's just like, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So I was following this, and one morning I read this article in the New York Times, New Jersey was about to vote, and I was like, oh, it's the same old issues, you know, which can which communities in the church is going to say no, and who's the conservatives, and you know, and I was just like, like, oh, I don't need to read this. But they did a profile of a family, and it was a husband and wife who'd been married for almost 20 years in a suburban town with two teenage kids, and the husband was in the process of transitioning. And they were going to stay together because they loved each other as a family. And the point of the article was all about marriage equality, which was if this law passed in New Jersey, and the husband was now a woman, and they were wife and wife, they would still be married. But if it didn't pass, they would no longer be married. So health insurance would go away, tax benefits would go away. And I went, shit, like that's the stuff of opera. Because it asks the question, who are you? Who are you in relationship to the people in your life? Who are you in a societal, political, social structure, and how do you decide how to be? And I just, it kind of stuck with me that I had to write this opera. And like, why would I write an opera? And it just felt like it was a story that needed to be theatrical. And somehow, because it was to me a story about soul and selfhood in this frame, that it had to be sung. And that's how I entered into the world of opera. But it was really about this journey of self-discovery and finding one's truth, and then all of the social, political, as I just said. And, and I just started out completely in ignorance as bliss mode. I had no idea what I was doing, but I just started the process. And it was born, and it hit. Luckily, it was just a lucky time, I think. The piece opened. Uh, at BAM in September of 2014, the same week that they announced the TV show, which I still have never seen, Transparent. And it was like all of a sudden, and, and, and Bruce Jenner changed her name. And it was like all of a sudden, it was the moment. And I think the piece resonated. Um, I think part of what was successful about its premiere, aside from the beautiful, beautiful, committed performances, of the cast and the direction and, and all of that, I'm so grateful to everybody who made it come to life, is that in anticipation, because we didn't think that this was going to be like a, a grand story at the time, that people were starting to talk about it. We were actually nervous about how to talk about this piece. So we did a series of engagement activities and we partnered with the Ackerman Family and Gender Institute that dealt with families. And we had panel discussions, and we, we reached out and met with kids and parents and the trans community, the LGBT center. And so it became a conversation. And that has continued through every production that has taken place around this country and abroad. Um, we've had 20, we'll have 24 productions in these three seasons. And in every single community, there has been very, and I know some of these companies are sitting out here. Mark and Kim and I are eternally grateful for the commitment that all of you have made. And this is the activism of the organization, to find partners in the community, to have a dialogue about citizenry and humanness and, and, and selfhood and what it is to be trans and gender fluidity and sensitivity around these issues. And time and time and again, there's this extraordinary moment when there's you know, the LGBT Youth Center comes in, and then the opera lovers come in, and at the end there's conversation, and somebody from the opera community says, I didn't think I was going to like it, first of all, I don't like modern opera, and then I thought it was a weird subject matter, but wow, that was really touching, or that made me think. 
And then the kids come up and they're like, wow, that was like, that's me. But they go, gee, I thought these people could sing so loud. You know, so like, the learning and the, the love goes both ways. You know, it's, it's about the art. And because of the subject matter, there's an activist piece of it. By engaging the community, we've been able to have this robust, very loving experience, whatever city we've gone to. And, and that's been a, a very affirming uh, experience and there are now like 28 people who have sung either Hannah before or Hannah after and they all feel like they're the Hannahs and, and they share with each other about some of the experiences that have just you know brought them to tears when people come up and say you told my story or a parent raises their hand and say by making this work my child feels like they're real you know I mean it's, it's been really very powerful but it didn't come from that reason. Mm -hmm. It came from a different reason. So, I think one of the things I find often is uh, a lot of <clears throat> people when they're starting out who see themselves as activists and want to start a way to get their voice out. I think oftentimes some of the early mistakes that can be made is they get so focused on trying to figure out how to do it as opposed to just as you said, finding something that moves them and letting it out and being able to move people in an honest way. Yeah. Our, our slogan, when we made our t-shirts, it's as one, and the back was truth will out, too. But it's all about truth. I mean, that's why we're artists. If you to make bullshit art, there's, it's like, there's no reason. You might get richer and more famous faster, but it ain't going to last. <laughs> um, ben, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit. I know that you have mentored a lot of uh, you know, young artists and composers and stuff. Uh, throughout your life, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about when somebody comes and says, I would like to be more active as an artist and I want to engage more, how do you help channel or mentor those kind of people and put them in a place where you feel they can succeed? Uh, well, I wasn't expecting that question, but I'm going to answer it for five <laughs> um, uh, I think one of the challenges that we <coughs> face as, as artists or as human beings is when we look at, at what's happening in the world and uh, and I uh, think we should do something about it. We want to do something about it, and we don't know how to do something about it. We're not sure if we if we text our ten dollar donation to the Red Cross and that's going to make a difference, or that uh, how could I possibly be spending time on making art when I should be in Africa eradicating the guinea worm, or whatever whatever it is that touches our soul about what we should do. And uh, when that comes up in conversation with my colleagues. Suggest that um, uh, that the activism needs to come from your uh, from who you are as a person, certainly from your soul and your desire to change the world and make it a better place, but also based on what it is that you can do, what it is that is your particular set of talents and skills, and orientations, and how you're best able to channel your good angels to do the best possible work, and that may not mean going to Maybe making music, it may be making an opera, it may be making a painting, it may be working in a community in some way. I live in a, uh, a uh, artist cooperative, and this comes up a lot as people are talking about. Um, they're making their art, they're doing uh, mostly visual artists, some performing, performing artists, uh, and then they're going to go march uh, for something or other. And they uh, oftentimes will think of those two as separate activities. Um, that as a person I'm going to march uh, and uh, protest, uh, but as an artist I'm going to make my work. And I think that um, my advice, uh, if you're asking Christian about uh, what to say to the younger people, is to see how you might integrate those two. And so that yes, certainly one can go and march, uh, one can protest, one can do all of the things that we are um, uh, encouraged to do as uh, activist human beings, but also to put into our art that which we would like to somehow inform the world or move people um, and serve as a springboard or as a catalyst for change ourselves in those gifts that, depending upon your theology, that God gave you or the universe saddled you with or whatever, however you imagine that. But we all have reasons for being, and I think that's, it goes back to the question that I've been 
asking this field for 30 years, which is, what do you want to accomplish with your life, and why have you chosen Alpha to do that? Yeah. Of course. You, you, what you said, just that, that difference between now I'm making my art and now I'm doing my activism, and that, that, and what I was saying in the beginning is that it really is all one. So, um, I, I'm going to talk about, I mentioned at the beginning this, this environmental project that I do, it's called Rising, it's called the Crossroads Project. My piece in it is called Rising Tide. And my university brought it to the Performing Arts Center um, as part of a thematic program in the university around and, you know, sustainability issues. So I was teaching the comp seminar that year, and I insisted that my students no, it wasn't that. It was a. It was a different course. It was a different seminar. But I insisted that my students create a piece that we would perform before the professional performance in at the Performing Arts Center. That that was their class assignment. It was actually a course called New Modalities in Chamber Music. And so I was challenging them to think about not just putting music on a concert with four pieces in an intermission and five program notes, but how do you do the music in different ways? And so this was a challenge to them to create something that would be not in a concert hall, but in front of one that had a theme. And we began by, I gave them some books to read about some of the issues that we're dealing with. So I had them read The Sixth Extinction. They were really mad that they had to read a book. <laughs> I, we began a conversation about activism, and they said, there's no reason for me to recycle my plastic bottle. It won't make any difference. The world's going to go to hell anyway. And it's like, okay, I get your cynicism, I get your apathy, but you still have to get a grade in this class. And I don't believe in grades, and they know it. Um, so I said, I want you guys to use your creativity as artists and just think around these issues and find a way to make something and do it with somebody who's not the composer in another discipline. And I don't care what it is, but I just need to make sure that what you're doing is safe and that we can legally do it in the lobby of <laughs> so they actually took that as a creative challenge, even though they were, they were resisting the political piece, and they were resisting the activism. Um, and they came up with a project where they, they commissioned a sculptor to build a piece that was about an ice block enclosed in plexiglass that they put sensor mics on it, and then they heated it, and as it melted, and Water drip, they then projected those sounds and then they wrote musical fragments. It was a beautiful, beautiful piece. And they built this thing, and I, I actually paid for it. I told them that I had a fundraise, but I paid for the whole thing because I wanted them to do it. But in the process of figuring it out, the symbology of the melting ice and the heat, and that that creates disruption, and you can capture the sound of that disruption to make something of beauty. <coughs> captured their imagination, and by the end, they were activists. And the following year, and I just let it go, and they all got fun, they all got A's. Um, <laughs> the following year, the president, and this was the first year after the new administration, and there was yet another sense of hopelessness and helplessness on the part of our students, said for one week, we're going to have days of activism and engagement, and you can do whatever you like, and some professors, refused to do anything other than teach what was on the syllabus, because the syllabus is, of course, sacrosanct, and being a human being is second. And I said, <laughs> and so I said to my class, and this was the comp seminar, I said, okay guys, what do you want to do? This is our community, you can choose anything, as long as we can come to a collective agreement about it, I will support you in your activism. And they said, well, we're thinking about the project we did last year, we're going to do a campus cleanup. And they cleaned up the campus of all afternoon. There were thousands of plastic bottles. Those kids who wouldn't recycle them a year ago collected thousands of them. So the, the engagement as an artist from the artistic that has idea behind it sparks the activism in this case. And I'm sorry that took so long, but it's just. It's just So it is a, a wonderful channel to one's own.
Um, oppression is structural. It is in the institutions, it is in the <coughs> systems that we have to engage with. And so you always do have to make a choice. You have to understand the structural barriers, the boundaries that exist, and figure out ways to work within them, around them, or decide, you know, that's that's what I'm not going to work with. It's always, it's not a it's not a one size fits all. But you know, if I'm an activist, then I'll only do this and not that, or I won't ever work with that, or you know, something like that. You really have to understand. Um, again, it's really about making a judgment about what's what's the application of this. Where is it going to uh, get seen or heard? Or where, where will the pressure be kind of most applied? Or where will it be able to flower most beautifully? You know, and um, if you're you know you're an artist working towards ending oppression and ending capitalism and ending racism, um, the systems that support capitalism and racism are not going to um, praise you for doing that. And so they're not going to pay you a lot of money for doing that. And so that is a very real consideration also, that you sometimes have to go in and out of different types of projects. You won't always be, you know, I'm not always able to make the projects I want to make because I do have to make money that sustains myself and, you know, a partner that I have. I can't only rely on his job. Um, and so I have to go in and out and I have to say, okay, right now I can't do this because I know I can only make X amount doing that and I can't only make X amount for this next year, for this next period. And so you're always, you know, as a, as a person, as an institution, as an artist, you're always judging, you're working within and around these structures that hopefully we're trying to transform and dismantle, but right now they're, they're not set up to benefit the disruptors. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I, well, I wanted to touch on is um, <clears throat> what it comes down to feeling helpless or angry um, and how we can manage to get past that. And so I, for a while, was working uh, in the South Bronx with a community of teenagers who were all HIV positive and the program had a very high mortality rate. Um, and I did that for a number of years and after a while I just, it wears you down. And so doing this kind of work and after a while it become very difficult to continue. And so. I was talking to somebody earlier today at lunch, and they were talking about how is it possible that you want to do anything creative right now when the world is burning? Um, and where do I get started? And how do I get past that? And I think you can start to feel a sense of drowning. So I want to, I want to see if anybody here on this panel had any words on that, or any, whether, on how to move forward in that way. Then go. Uh, I've experienced that. Uh, and what I've found is that oftentimes what keeps me going is single conversation or somebody that I don't know well um, comes up at a conference or uh, one of my uh, one of the younger people I work with um, I bump into and uh, uh, unsolicited uh, affirms something that I had offered them or said to them or had an impact on them in some way and I find that little affirmation kind of makes me realize oh I did make a difference in somebody's life. I guess I can continue uh, in some way. Uh, I've also learned that uh, it's okay to ask for that. Uh, for the times when you're feeling particularly down, uh, find out if you're making a difference, because I suspect that more often than not you are, and people may not be um, uh, enough to tell you. Um, so ask, find out what's happening, uh, get the feedback, um, do your evaluation, to find out what's happening. Uh, so that's one way to, I think, that, to keep us going. It is about doing the work every day and having the conviction that somehow you're making a difference uh, in some in some small way. Sometimes in some large way it may become the fact that that one's being done so often, obviously it's happening that. That must be very gratifying to you. Uh, so sometimes it does happen in large and overt ways. In other ways, they much more subtle. Um, but it's every day it's getting up and doing the work Trusting that you're making an impact. Um, so, so the question, you know, with everything going on, why make art? And last night, I see this image in the in the program, and I, I don't know if you all can see that. <coughs> or if folks can pass it around. This was last year's um, repertory of, of production. Look at this image, you know. I mean, it just struck me so hard. And I'll, I'll keep it up here so you can. It later. But also I find that um, depression and um, hopelessness, disappointment, it really is also a tool of the oppressor. It is a way in which our inherent power is um, suppressed. You know, the power of millions of billions of people who want justice and righteousness in the world. 
Um, if, we, if we can believe that we are powerless, if we can believe that it's not worth it, then, then the you know, oppressor has won. The status quo has been maintained. Um, and so it is hard, I'm not saying it's like, oh yeah, it's so easy to feel so hopeful every day, you know? Um, and so when you need to take a break, you take a break. You know, that's how you rejuvenate and rest and get the healing that you need so that you can recommit yourself to the struggle because it is a struggle. That is one characteristic, I guess you can say, of you know, um, activists or press. We are in dynamic struggle all the time. And so when it gets unhealthy, when it gets hard, you need to stop. I've been writing a one woman show this last year about my own migration story and my people's migration story, and I'm in a small writing group of women of color. And you know, one one of our meetings, I say, oh well, I, mean, I, I just you know, I know I have to write this, and, and I have these deadlines, but I just felt like I should do this other research, and I felt like going over there, but I didn't want to waste my time, and I needed to get this done. And one of my writing group members said, it's okay if this is too much for you, because it's a lot. It's a lot of emotions. It's a lot of looking at my past looking at my parents and looking at what happened to us. If it's too much, go ahead and do that other research that you need to do. Your mind is probably telling you to, you know, take a break from the emotional experience of whatever you're writing, that it's too much. So we have to, you know, um, just keep ourselves in balance, but we never have to be, we may feel hopeless or we may feel uh, disappointed, but please remember that that's not the truth. The truth is that we have inordinate amount of power, and we can and we are making great change and um, keep yourself healthy so you can keep at it. Kind, you know, one of the things that just, one of the, 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 that just occurred to me is Martha Graham has a wonderful quote about practice and getting our, developing our skill. And in some ways she refers to artists as becoming athletes of God. And when we think about that, you know, athletes don't play 24 seven. Uh, they take time off between games. Uh, they practice, of course, but they also take time off. And you know, any, any of you that exercise, I've heard about exercise, I'm not sure what <laughs> <laughs> My understanding is that, is that you, you know, the time off is when your body rejuvenates. And I think that if we're going to be the athletes of God that we're expected to be, then that we deserve and can we have to take the time off to, to allow ourselves to rejuvenate and, uh, and feed, our own, feed our own souls so that we can feed others. Lord, did you want to add anything to that? I, yeah, I saw you. Yeah, I think, I think sort of um, underscores what you both said, but it's that it's that if you're really an artist, it has to come from an honest place. And so if you're stuck, that's honest. And you better not be important when you're stuck. Mm -hmm. You probably need to exercise so that you can stay engaged with the stuff of your work, but it's okay to not make it. And, and I, I'm gonna go, I don't know why I'm talking about my students, but, um, I was away with As One last year on election day. And I came back the week afterwards and my students were a mess. And of course, we're not allowed to really talk about the politics in class, but some kids came in, I can't believe this, I am so upset. I wrote six songs last week. <laughs> and one kid came in who was this beautiful, sweet young man who looked like he had been, you know, literally had some weird disease that had ravaged him. And he was Mexican-American, and he was freaking out. His parents were undocumented, and he thought they were gonna be deported in a day. And so he had nothing to show. So when we got to the comp seminar, I said, look, guys, I'm not gonna have a conversation with you about the outcome of this election, other than we can all agree that, for the most part, the country was stuck. Whether you're happy or sad is not gonna talk about here. But what we are going to talk about is that some of you, this riled you up and you had an outpouring of creativity. And some of it was good and a lot of it was really crappy. <laughs> <laughs> but it was honest. You were having a lot of emotions and you expressed yourself through your art. Some of you had a lot of emotions and expressed yourself like, through your art and then had the ability to step back and edit yourself and try to make art out of that expression. And some of you were ravaged by this and made no art. And I have to give all of you a grade. Who gets the A? And we had a conversation. I mean, I, I don't believe in grades, so it was it was a hypothetical. But it was really that conversation about like, who's really the artist? What does it mean to be an artist? And what is your work? And and I think that's kind of the core of the conversation. I mean, 
and I'd love to see what everybody else would say to that, to that conversation. Um, Gil, as a poet, you're often, and I know that you're also from the Grand Slam of the poetry world, um, oftentimes it is about creating works quickly and succinctly, and saying things in a way that are relevant. How do you feel uh, in a world that is changing so rapidly, and there's so many things happening, that you can keep up in that way as an artist? Mm, that's a good question. Um, it goes back to what Laura uh, was just mentioning. It's, it's really about what feels true to you. A lot of times in the, the world of poetry, um, and in, in, in uh, playwriting, so I help uh, people in getting like intro into playwriting and everything. They want to write things that are very topical, uh, and they want to, to write it. Sometimes they write it from their truth. Uh, sometimes, uh, especially in poetry, they write it for the applause, uh, unfortunately, because they know if they say certain trigger words, and they're gonna, because I don't know if you guys know too much about the world of poetry slam, but it's the competition of, of poetry. So, you know, people still remember that, that competition part, so they know that in a room full of liberal, other liberals, that they say the right trigger words, that's gonna help them out. But I, I feel like when it comes from your truth, then it, you can definitely tell a difference, and, and, and that's the people that you gravitate to. And I think that that's the reason why I've been able to make a living off of playwriting and, and poetry and, and performing, uh, is because that I, I take in all that's going in, but I make sure that whatever comes out, it's through my story. Does that make sense? You know, I don't, I don't just uh, tell a story about, say, Donald Trump and how I feel about it. Well, I, I, I live in my, my child who's half black, half Mexican, and, and how I'm going to raise this kid in this world and the conversation that I'm going to have to have when he gets older, because he does, he's in a bubble right now, my, and my daughter too. I have a, a three-year, a two-year-old, and a three-month-old, and and um, these conversations that me and my wife are going to have with them—that's really real to me. And and I, it's it's scary. Um, it's it's really scary. Uh, the other night, my I got mad at my wife. This is kind of an aside, but it goes back into this artwork. The other night, my, my, my wife wanted me to pick up a, a little play thing for, for my daughter, it's three months old, and she went on Facebook and it was one of those exchange things where she gets it for free, and she, so she said, uh, it's at this person's house, it's in their front yard, uh, can you go get it? After I was at rehearsals, can you go get it? And I was like, I wasn't thinking, and I was like, sure. And then I get there, and the neighborhood is kind of pitch black, it was like nine o'clock at night, so there's still some lights on and everything, and they had a big front yard and all this stuff in here. And I, as soon as I left the car, I'm like, I should not be here. <laughs> like, rooting around in this person's front yard, it wasn't like I'm going to, straight to their door, I'm just, and, and for my wife, she didn't even think of it like that, uh, and, and I was kind of petrified, because like, uh, this is the kind of stuff that later on, and now I have to teach my son, like, you can't put yourself in these situations. And these kind of situations, this happens to me all the time. Like I, I'm also the artist in resident for uh, my church, and um, there I, they told me to pick up some chairs in the front of the church. They're going to sleep out in front. So here I am pulling up and then dump loading chairs, and, and, and no one else is around. And so these things are in my head. And this kind and in this world where every time I turn on social media, another African American is getting who is in Harvard or in Yale or in, you know what I'm saying, is a teacher, is a lawyer, and they're getting stopped and harassed and everything in this climate. Um, and, and no, no, and I was telling my wife, like, sometimes no matter of explaining can, can stop the, the, something from happening. Um, to me, that really informs my art. And, and so I won't just go on a tirade about Trump, but I'll, I'll go through my experience. And the more that you can do that as artists, you're A, being truthful, and B, you're being an activist. And then, and I think through personal narrative and personal stories, or telling someone, telling the story of, of, of something that's very close to you, I think more people resonate with it. And then you can start having those conversations. Because that's what it's all about, is it's about how can we 
help others gain empathy and grow empathy in, in this world um, and, and have more conversations and not be afraid to have more conversations and, and, and not say things like, I don't see color. And, uh, you know, and everybody is all one guy. I hear, I hear this all the time, people trying to be very uh, uh, PC with me. And I'm like, no, see me, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and if you don't see me, here's my art. Let me, let me show you uh, who I am and what I represent and everything. So um, uh, that's, that's my answer. Thank you, Beth. Thank you so much. I want to move the conversation a little bit into why opera and how we can do this in the operatic art form. So I'll start a little bit with uh, part of my story, which was um, I did burn out for a little bit after I was working with that community of teenagers. Um, it's hard when the people you're working with are constantly passing and you, and you feel powerless. Um, and so what I ended up moving away into was uh, I was doing a lot of documentary theater. Um, back then, and I started moving into fables. Um, I'm Mexican, so for me, fables are, that culture is very much rooted to the you know, mythology and fables, and you've seen Pan's Labyrinth or anything that's been created in that world. I live there, and so I started creating a piece of work which was based on a short story that uh, me and my lyricist wrote about, it was called Fatty Fatty No Friends, and it was about a little fat boy who gets bullied by all his kids, and he gets bullied so much that he eats everyone. And the whole point of that was about uh, the point of that story for me was to talk about othering, and that's really all that show was about. It's about if you take a community and you keep forcing them and telling them they're going to be one thing, they will eventually become that thing. You keep giving them that narrative over and over and over again. And it was about my experience as a Mexican American, about having to assimilate, and how to get rid of my accent, how to do all of these things that I had to do, and feeling like I was going to snap. When we opened that show a couple of years ago, uh, there was a school shooting on opening night. And so the press changed what my show was about and said, this is the school shooting musical. Uh, which was an operetta, by the way, but I'm not gonna argue that front. Uh, and so uh, that, uh, I, was very, I was very upset because I thought that's the end of this piece. And so I got into this wave of like, how do I keep keeping up with the social norms and how am I making new relevant work when I always feel like I'm gonna be one step behind. By the time I've raised the money and I've got a company and I've got somebody who's gonna do it, this is gonna feel old. That show has now had, it's about to embark on its ninth production. Every time we've started rehearsals, there's been a school shooting, sadly. Oh my God. The show has never, has always seemed to move outside of it. And it's not perceived as a school shooter show. However, it also has been relevant when we did it at in Tunisia. And for them it was about Arab and American relations. And I, when I did it in Mexico, it was about um, assimilation. So this, when you create art that is true, and I wanted to touch on what these guys were saying, and the reason I wanted to do it as an opera is because the music can carry that narrative. And so as an opera, and we'll keep arguing about that forever. Uh, but um, for me, it was about figuring out the way that the music would tell that story. And the story is honest, and there's a high aesthetic that goes with it, that people find relevance within that. So Ben, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what your thoughts on art how we can create, through opera or through music, how we can be artists and move forward in that way. So you had some thoughts. <laughs> Specifically in terms of the opera field. Uh, it actually touches on two topics that have, been, uh, that have come up in the last couple of days. One is around the idea of the canon, and creating works for the canon. Uh, and, uh, and that strikes me as a um, uh, fool's game, uh, that the works in the canon were not created to be in the canon, they were created to touch and move and to uh, make money sometimes, uh, and to uh, do all the other things that art can do, and the canon grew out of that. Uh, and I've worked with and seen a lot of composers attempting to make work that will go into the canon. And any effort to, to require something to go into the canon uh, is, uh, is not going to work. And I think that we need to let go of that, this notion that we're creating something that will be universal and will be beloved for years to come. We have no control over it. We do have some control over what we put down on paper, what we do in the rehearsal room, and what we do on the stage, and that's where we should be putting our uh, attention. Um, I think related to that is the notion of the, um, the occasional piece, what used to be called the occasional piece, a piece written for an occasion. Um, the idea that a composer, a writer, and other artists might be commissioned to, um, to mark an event to celebrate it, uh, to 
underscore it in some way to draw attention to it or whatever it might be. Um, and uh, the interesting thing for me is this notion of how opera companies, and I'll speak about sort of the larger companies and the sort of the mythology that's going on around that. Boy, it just takes years to write an opera. Yeah, Rossini didn't think so. Uh, many of the classic works were created very quickly. And my experience has been working with uh, composers and writers that when they are given some specific parameters, uh, perhaps even asked to a tool to work with ahead of time, um, and asked to write around sub uh, uh, subject that is dear to them, that they feel passionate about, it can happen much more quickly than we think. And for me, the frustration is the idea that we build a box and then we complain that we're boxed in. Um, and I think that we keep telling ourselves these things about, oh, opera is so expensive, opera is so uh, large, uh, opera takes a long time to create, opera belongs in the opera house, um, opera requires international stars and an orchestra of 70. We lay out all these things and then we question, well, why can't we be responsive to things that are happening immediately? And so I think that there, I think we need to call out our colleagues on this particular topic. I don't think that all of those things are necessarily true all the time. Some of them are true some of the time, but they're not always true all the time. And I think that if a company wants to be responsive, they actually have the capability of doing that if they can step outside of the box that they've made for themselves. If something happens in your community that people are talking about, that people are concerned about, that you as an artist are concerned about and want to address, you have the capability of addressing it artistically. It may not be the kind of work that's gonna land in the cabin, but you don't have any control over that anyway. So let go of that and focus on what is it that you can use? How can you go about using what you can do as an artist? The gifts that you have as an artist, whether it's as a composer, writer, performer, producer, director, whatever it is, to say, here's what I can do in this amount of time with these parameters. And uh, uh, things can come together very, very quickly uh, when the circumstances are right. And you probably have more control over the circumstances than you think. Um, uh, just to go along with what you said, so the re one of the reasons why I'm here is because uh, I came up, like I said, as a spoken word artist, and then one day I decided, uh, I just thought it sounded cool, I want to uh, write a spoken word opera, you know, and what would that look like, and, 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 and it, it was before I had even went to, I think I had gone to one opera before, you know, and, but because I said that and then uh, started pitching that idea, and people started getting on board that I was able to be introduced to the San Diego Opera and started working with them and everything. Uh, and we put it together in less than a year. Uh, and you know, you guys may see it and say, oh, that's not anything like an opera. But to me, it was, and, and, and a lot of people enjoyed it. And people still you know, talk to me about it, but I had the benefit of being naive. And I feel like uh, sometimes what you have to do and I, and I talk to artists all the time where they, they want to get their art out, but they feel like they have to go through all these different steps to put it out there. But sometimes you, uh, it's it's okay to encourage people to, to, like you said, to start small and just get it out and then fix the mistakes later on if you want to continue with that or you want to leave it as it is. Um, but you can be proud of just these, these small projects. Um, like, it, you know, in your communities, people have things to say. If you, if one of you guys went to them and said, like, hey, we want to put, I'll give you the space. You know, you can just give them, like, the small space. You can create something and invite your community to, like, that would be magic to somebody. You just don't realize, like, that how powerful that would be just for someone, like, uh, when I was creating my like, spoken word opera, uh, I was speaking to an architect of all things, and he was excited about it, and he wrote a ten thousand dollar check, like right there. Uh, and I was like, whoa! And, and and to him, you know, I know that it was because he was, you know, he had he was well off. It wasn't. It was small, but to me, it was like huge. And for the budget, I had learned later of an opera that's pretty, ten thousand was pretty small. So uh, you know, just these little acts of, of empowering people and, and maybe showing them a few things about what it is that you do to to help them. Uh, you, some powerful things can come out, you know? It doesn't have to be this huge thing all the time. Yeah, I, I think we should always try to remember that the human to 
don't think outside the box. There is no box. Mm -hmm. There's no box. It's a construct in your mind that uh, locks us in, in places. You know, it's fascinating to compare the opera field, say, with the theater field. And that the theater field has the advantage or disadvantage of how you see it, that they make new work all the time. And occasionally they'll draw upon the past. They even have a word for it. They're called revivals. <laughs> but they're reviving something that has been dead for a while. They're going to bring it back. But they value some of the work. But mostly it's about contemporary work and the sense of responsiveness that they have is really remarkable. In the opera field, unfortunately, we've been saddled with this large chunk of fabulous, incredibly wonderful material that then serves as the standard for the little bit of new work that we do. And as long as we think about that everything that we do, the new work has to match the quality of the stuff that has risen to the surface over 300 years, we're screwed. Because the reality is, is that most new work is not very good based on those standards. That has always been the case of any, whether it's visual arts or performing arts, it's just the way because people are, are trying, to, trying to make good work. Nobody's trying to set out to, to make bad work, but as you say, your students who were inspired, a lot of the stuff was crap. Well, that's kind of true for a lot of the art that gets made, generally speaking, across the board. Because we, we, we judge it based on standards from the past. And the real question is, are you making work that is touching people, moving people? Is it, is it, does it come from your soul? Are you passionate about it? Are you using your talents to the best of, it, of your own ability? That's what's going to give it some sense of life. And, and the most wonderful thing about doing a lot of work, whether it's crap or not, is that you learn how not to make crap. You know, and I'd rather work with a composer that has, you know, spent, had made one opera a year for 10 years than a composer that has made one opera over 10 years. You know, because they learn their crafts that way. That's how you, that's how you, you practice, you get better at it by making mistakes and learning from mistakes and making it better. You know, a, um, Otello is a much better opera than Nabucco. Great, well thank you so much guys. I would, we have uh, about, 15 minutes left, so I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, so, yes, sir. Own world that is 
you know, uh, subject to the push and pull of the structural world that we're involved in. And whether someone empathizes with that or not, then that's, that's their issue, you know. So that's what barriers have they put up? Um, if you've told a true and multi-layered and uh, grounded story, um, you know, definitely we don't want to stage argumentation. And it's funny because you mentioned space because I'm, as I'm working on my solo show, um, my director has told me, can't hey, think about space in the text. And the way we're thinking about space is thinking about music. And so, I mean, luckily opera has, you know, the foundation is music. And uh, the space you can create with music, just like Laura was saying, like, how do you, how did this um, scientist start to bring in music into his lectures so that, you know, the conversation after wasn't about the decimal point, but was about the, you know, experience and the, the pain and the alienation of losing one's natural environment. It seems to me, too, part of it is uh, what clarity around your intention in making the piece. If you're making a piece that's intended to persuade somebody about something, that's a different set of strategies than if you're making a piece that's going to celebrate a particular point of view. Uh, and to know who your audience is, what you're trying to accomplish with your art. And I think that's an important consideration. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I have a question that's a little bit maybe of a chicken and the egg sort of a question. Um, and this might actually go off what you were saying, Ben. Um, as creators or as creators of opera, I think a lot of us uh, come to like uh, maybe a message that we want to say something. And so obviously you can come to the message and say, well, I want to say this. And then you find a story that fits that message. Or when, so my question is, is that better? Or do you find it's more organic? If you find a story and you say, what message is this story telling? And it kind of grows organically out of a, does that make sense? Versus message versus story first. And is one better than the other? And, or, or not? Is the question. I personally don't believe that there's either a better process. I think you can hit it both ways. There's some of the most successful works I've seen have come out of nowhere, like um, as Laura was saying, you, you have a story to tell and people carry a message out of it. There's another, I'm, I'm working on a set that is in cycle. Obviously there I have a pretty set <laughs> uh, thing that I have to work towards in each one. Um, so I don't necessarily know that there is one that is better than the other. I don't have anyone of my colleagues here disagree about the process. Well, I think, I think about the uh, movie producer Sam Goldwyn that said, if I want to send a message, I'll send a telegram. <coughs> And I'm not sure if having something to say, what needs to, what, if you've got something to say, opera may not be the best format to do that. Because what happens in an opera is not as important as how it happens. And this form is much more about illuminating something that we, uh, a, uh, a narrative that we already know. Um, that we don't go to the opera to find out what's going to happen. We go to find out how this story is going to be told. Um, how the composer and writer are going to use their skills to tell a story that uh, that we may already know the basics of, um, or how this particular performer is going to interpret this particular role if it's a piece that we already know. Uh, it's it's one of the reasons why the art form has relied so much on adaptations um, uh, because we uh, we don't have to go to find out what's going to happen, um, and I think that. Um, then the, so then, if that's the case, then I think the challenge is, yes, there's some material that speaks to me, and what am I going to do with this? Well, how, do I, how do I justify turning it into an opera uh, without just telling the story that we've heard before? So all of these operas are being written on, on musicals or plays that are, are very popular, and so many of them seem to be telling the same story again, but without any uh, reason to have it be musicalized. Um, and then when you have the original material, such as that one or some of the other pieces that, that uh, we've talked about, there there is a, um, uh, it's, it's, it seems to me, and I can't speak for you, Lori, you have to address this, it's not about this is the message I want to send, but this is an experience I want to create so that somebody in the audience can ponder these issues for themselves and come to their own conclusion, as opposed to saying, you must feel this way about this. You know, unless you're writing a piece to inform, and again, there may be better art forms that will inform if the specifics of the subject matter are important to you. Any other questions?
I did have a question and that I, it's not fully formed in my mind, um, but I guess I'm wondering, um, it, are there times when you feel like the best way to use your platform or maybe your privilege is to amplify other stories? And how do you make that decision of when you are, want to tell your story versus making space for others that might not have the platform you have to tell their stories? That's actually really interesting because in 2002, 2003, I wrote my first one on the show and it was all about the experience of Arab South Asian Muslim women uh, and their families were involved in the post 9 11 uh, scapegoating of uh, Muslim Arab and South Asian families and the special registrations basically the first iteration of the Muslim ban, um, where many uh, men had to go and register themselves if they were of a certain nationality and that they were extra judiciously spirited away to detention centers. And um, and I, I knew that, you know, even though my family wasn't directly affected, um, this this was a story that needed to be told. And so I needed to tell those stories because so many people were scrambling and struggling and just unable to, you know, just like <coughs> your student who said, I, you know, like, I'm really thinking about the next strategies about how do we survive, how do we exist, how do we keep ourselves safe. I'm not in a headspace where I can say, how can I theatricalize this or tell the story to others, and I was. Um, and so I, I definitely said, no, this is what needs to be told. And now, um, you know, uh, 15 years later, I'm still thinking about those things. But this time, as I started to think about, oh, no, I want to tell this kind of larger political story, I, it really makes sense that it needed to be captured in my migration story, that this time it was about, let's look at the cycles that this country continues uh, to put people through. And, and the best way I can do that is grounded in my reality and experience of coming to America in 1981, the end of the Iran hostage crisis with a name like Irani, um, fleeing the revolution in Iran, <laughs> coming here and fleeing or trying to get away from you know, the violence and the bullying, and then things being okay, and then 9-11 happening, and suddenly now I have a new identity in America based on what stories the media and, and our government was saying about people who look like me. And now, you know, and so now, but now I'm four, you know, now 15 years after that or whatever, 18 years after that, I'm now 40 years old. And you know, as a 40 year old, what am I thinking of? And, and hearing from the children of my friends who's uh, young, who's, you know, very small children are being bullied and um, you know fearful of their everyday life. Um, so, so it made it made sense for it to come through my eyes, you know, because that's what I want to. So it, it's always a, a balance. You have to kind of just just judge really what is again the best application of your talents, the best application of um, your your um, resources. Um, for myself, I may just uh, pact with myself that. Uh, I was once sitting uh, at a room full of artists and we were all complaining that nobody was coming to see our works. And somebody brought up the fact that, you know, if everybody here went to each other's works, there's, you know, 10 sold out houses. Um, and so, uh, one of the things that I promised myself uh, was that for every piece that I was creating and, and working towards, that I was also going to be working on somebody else's piece and helping giving them a voice. And then what I ended up building through that was a, a, was a collective and a community that of really different minded artists who were all supporting each other in all different kinds of walks of life. Ended up working and helping running the Fridge Festival to do that. So every year I was like, for every show that I get to put on for myself, I'm helping 200 others come to life. Um, and I think it's important because art, and particularly activism, can be lonely. And the more that you're giving yourself to others, the more you're also gonna get back. And it really does work that way. Um, and you have to, I think that's part of that. We have time for one final question. Here you, go. Yes. Um, you mentioned this a little bit in this idea of burnout from working with these populations. Um, my background previously has been in arts and medicine, and we talk a lot in that world about protecting our artists and caring for our artists who are working with these vulnerable populations because without the right preparation and care before and after, it can be really damaging to them. And so I'm wondering if there's anything um, that's out there and, and kind of accessible that either you found as artists to be helpful as, as kind of that burnout prevention or tools or things that you would like other opera companies, especially people who are in the position of signing up artists to go and work with these populations to be able to do that. Um, I think
think uh, it was best said by my colleagues here about you have to be able to think about this as a long, long term. So you can get really easy to start getting into a place where I have to do this tomorrow and I have to do this tomorrow. And, and I think that creates a lot of anxiety. At least for me, that was the burnout. And I wasn't thinking about it as Ben said, as like as an athlete. You know, and you have to take the time to exercise and to warm up and to rest, and rest being the really key part of that. So if you're an administrator, yeah. <laughs> if you're an administrator working with a community of artists, uh, I would encourage you to allow them and give them the opportunity and the space to be able to, to rest and do that. Um, one of the sadder uh, things I saw working at the UN was the burnout amongst people who were doing things like the Peace Corps or people who were on the yeah, they could only do it for two or three years. And the conversation was always like, why are these people like, how can they go and do it for two or three years? I'm like, because we're, we're not letting them rest. Um, and I think that's that's the biggest part of that, is just be human. <laughs> be human with each other. Yeah. Also, um, Urban Bushwomen has a really interesting process that um, their founder, Jawale Jovila Zolar, um, developed in, in terms of the dancers working in community. Um, it was it was both a protection mechanism for community and for the artist, and they they developed a whole process around how do you enter a community uh, and do that work, and then how do you leave, you know, so that you're everyone is kind of taken care of and um, you know considered and all the things that might come up or, or thought about. And I would look into that. It's a great resource. What was that name? Uh, Ur Urban Bushwomen. Jawale Jawila Zolar was the founder. I don't know if she's still the founder or ED. Yeah. She's, still she, I mean, she's the founder, obviously. <laughs> I mean, uh, she was the ED also, but the Urban Bushman continue with that methodology. I want to thank everybody on this panel here. Uh, thank you so much.